Armor of God. If you're taking notes or if you are re-watching this, I want to welcome you as well. I'm going to throw in a few, few pointers about spiritual warfare and then we're going to break down the armor of God. The first thing I want to mention is that everyone lives in the spiritual world but not everyone engages in spiritual warfare. Come on, uh, let me say that again. Everybody lives in the spiritual world but not everyone engages in spiritual warfare. We must understand the world we live in is spiritual. We must understand that God calls us to engage in spiritual warfare. God doesn't call us to try to connect into to the spiritual world because we already have the connection through the Holy Spirit. We already have the connection through Jesus to the spiritual world. God that we serve is the Spirit and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. But what I'm talking about right now is not connecting to God who lives in the Spirit. I'm talking about engaging the spiritual warfare by working alongside with God against the powers and the principalities, demonic forces that are waging against our soul. It's one thing to be delivered from the enemy. It's totally another to defeat your enemy as a soldier of Jesus Christ. If you're taking the story, and I'm currently reading through the book of Judges, excuse me, the book of Joshua, when Joshua is entering into the promised land and I'm seeing this, this, these principles and I'm going to share with you a few before I jump into the armor of God. If you're watching the story of how Israel conquered the promised land, you can see how God wants each Christian to walk in spiritual warfare. Come on, any spiritual warriors we have in the chat right now? Come on, drop that in the chat if you are a spiritual warrior. Drop number one in the chat if you are a spiritual demon slayer, giant killer and your spiritual sniper. We are warriors, we are soldiers in warfare. And as soldiers in warfare, we must understand God wants to take us from deliverance to dominion. God wants to take us from needing deliverance to executing His will, executing His wrath, His punishment on the enemy and defeating the enemy. Egypt was the place of being delivered but promised land was the place of defeating the enemy and that's exactly what Joshua did. See deliverance from the enemy has to lead you to defeating the enemy and that's why when you get delivered God doesn't remove the battle. He removes the bondage and so many people what happens is that they get delivered and they're like, why am I still in the battle? I am delivered. Why am I still fighting? Why am I still in the warfare? You know why you're in the warfare? Because deliverance does not remove warfare. Deliverance removes bondage. Deliverance removes wickedness. Deliverance conquers your weaknesses but deliverance does not protect you from warfare. Deliverance puts you into warfare. When you get delivered from the enemy, you were a slave. But when you defeat the enemy, you become a soldier. And God is not just interested in getting you out of the enemy, getting you out of the problem. He is interested and invested in building out of you a man and a woman of God, a soldier in His army. Another thing that I want to mention is when Joshua goes to the promised land, something else happens. The warfare really intensifies by these two signs. Moses dies and manna stops. Moses dies and manna stops and the warfare begins. A lot of times I've noticed that when your means of provisions change, when your finances change, and when certain relationships that you have had begin to change, you are stepping into an intense warfare. Some of you who are watching and re-watching right now, you're currently in the place where manna stopped, where the means of provision that was God's blessing in the previous season have come to an end. When Moses dies, it's when certain people who were in your life for a reason and for a season, they exit. When manna is taken off the menu and people exit your life, a lot of times you enter into a, an intense spiritual warfare. Is there anybody in the chat right now that you're currently going through a season when manna has been removed out of the menu? Meaning this thing that you relied on is no longer there. This thing 
that you relied, this person that you relied on exited. Joshua entering the promised land experiences an exit of Moses and an exit of manna. Sometimes when we enter into a new season of our life that we experience warfare, these two things they mark the shift of seasons is when the finances begin to change. Sometimes there's an attack on finances, but sometimes there is God who is removing certain flow of finances in the new season of our life. And the second thing that happens is people. People that maybe have brought joy in the previous season, they exit, they leave. Gideon's army shrunk before Gideon went into victory. What I'm trying to say, and I felt before praying today, as I was spending some time in prayer today, I really felt the Holy Spirit put on my heart to tell somebody, your best days are still ahead of you, even if the best people around you left your life. Those people who left you and exited your life, God's calling is not connected to them. God's calling is connected to you. There is Abrahams that are watching me right now and the lot has left your life and you're discouraged and you feel like you're shrinking, you feel like there's a purging that is taking place, there's a pruning, pruning that is taking place and you are stepping into a season and there's a warfare that is being intensified right now because the enemy is hitting your mind, the enemy is hitting your emotions, the enemy is saying you lost it, you're not going to win, you're going to die, you're not going to make it. You will never step into something new. God's promises are not going to be real in your life because Moses left you, Lot left you, this person left your life, the 70 disciples that walked with you left you, therefore you're not going to make it. Judas left you. You must understand there are people in our life, they are like scaffolding. They are there for a reason and for a season and when the purpose for which they were in our life is fulfilled, God removes the scaffolding. God removes those people, He puts them in somebody else's life. And when God puts some people out from, when Moses exits your life, that means you have entered the promised land. Come on somebody, drop that in the chat. When Moses exits your life, that means you have entered the promised land. The entrance of the promised land will always be an exit of someone who walked with you for 40 years, been with you for 40 years. Why am I saying that? Because usually when Moses exits, when there is an exodus of certain people, a spiritual warfare begins and this warfare happens right here. You feel lost, you feel scared, you feel like I won't make it, you feel like I don't know what to do. Maybe you are a mother and maybe you lost a relationship. Maybe a man who decided to walk away from marriage and you feel like that's it, I won't make it. My life is over, I'll never be able to raise children. Perhaps you are a man and the woman has walked away from your life and you walked together for so many years and you can't believe that this is happening. Your idea of stepping into the promised land was with Moses. I mean you didn't see your life without Moses and yet Moses exited the scene. Moses, Moses left the picture. Moses is no longer in the next chapter of your life and you dis you're despaired and you said, I am not going to make it. And listen to me, I, there's a word from God for you right now. You will make it because you're going to depend on God, not on Moses. Listen to me Joshua. The next season that you are entering, God is taking you there and the fact that Moses exited your life, God did not exit your life, He remained. Your destiny is not tied to people that you lost, your destiny is tied to God's promise. Your destiny is tied to God's presence, I feel that in my spirit right now. Your destiny is tied to the promise God has given you, not to the people that have walked with you for 10 or 15 years. Every time God takes you to greater fruitfulness, He will prune you. 
Every time God will take you to promised land, He will remove Moses. Word Lot means veil. When Lot left Abraham's life, the Bible says, Then the Lord said to Abraham, Lift up your eyes and look at the land that I have given you. Sometimes there are people in our lives, when they overstay, they become the veil for us to see the next season and we depend on them more than we depend on God. So you say, how is this with spiritual warfare? Because honestly, that's why spiritual warfare starts. People begin to exit, frustration settles in. Depression wants to enter. When people exit, despair wants to enter. When people exit, fear wants to enter. Cowardness wants to enter. I'm not going to make it. God has abandoned me. Why is this happening to me? I didn't see my future like that. When jobs exit, when manna exits, you're like, what am I going to do? That's the only thing I've known. But see, you must understand, God never promised you manna. He promised you milk and honey. Manna was God's provision for you, but milk and honey was God's promise for you. So when God takes the manna off of the menu, it's because He's preparing you for milk and honey. When God takes the provision off of the menu, it's because He's preparing you for prosperity. When it seems like the things that were just paying your bills and they were just enough and they stop, listen to me, when your brook dries up, it's because God is preparing to take you to the river. God is preparing to take you to the overflow. God is preparing to taking you to a place of abundance. And no, I am not healthy, wealthy, prosperity, a prosperity preacher, but I believe that though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death and I come out of that, He anoints my head with oil and my cup runs over. And the spiritual warfare is this frustration that begins to take place in your heart and in your mind. You're looking at your finances and you're noticing something changed. <laughs> Fear comes in. Oh my God, I'm not going to make it. Lord, where are you? You're looking and the people that you really relied on, they're gone and you feel alone. And that's why the first chapter of Joshua, God keeps telling Joshua this one word. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Only be courageous. Can somebody drop that in the chat? No fear. No fear. No fear. Come on somebody. Drop a hashtag in the chat. No fear. Why does God allow that? So that you will depend on Him and so that there will be no fear. No fear of the future. No fear of, finance, of, of finances. No fear of being alone because you're never really alone. You're with God. No fear. No fear. Somebody dropped that in the chat. We will not live in fear. We will live in faith. See, in order to walk in spiritual warfare, you must walk in faith. You must walk in faith. You must combat fear. Before Joshua fought Jericho, Joshua had to fight fear. A lot of people, what they don't realize is the demons are not the problem. For many of us, the nightmares are not the problem. For many of us, it's not the spirit spouse that we're battling with. We're battling with fear. The fear of problems coming back. The fear of problems never changing. The fear of our life never improving. That fear, my friend, is worse because that fear paralyzes your ability to move forward. People in the promised land that Joshua conquered, before he conquered them, you know who conquered them? Paranoia. Fear. They were so afraid that they closed up, they already were defeated. If you want to walk in spiritual victory, you must understand, fear has to be illegal. You have to get fear out of your life. The devil will use your circumstances. He will use the exit of Moses and he will use the exit of manna to bring the entrance of fear. When manna and Moses leaves, fear will stand at the door and say, I'm here. I'm going to replace Moses and I'm going to replace manna. And I'm here to tell somebody, punch the fear in the face. I'm here to tell somebody, do not be afraid because God is with you. Do not be afraid because the Red Sea will split in front of you. 
Do not be afraid because the Jericho walls will fall. Do not be afraid because the best days are ahead of you. Do not be afraid because God is on the move. Do not be afraid because He has never abandoned you, He has never forsaken you and God is your provider. Do not be afraid because in place of manna God will prepare milk. Do not be afraid because in the place of Moses He will raise you up to be the general and to be the leader of His people. Do not be afraid. You might not have a rod of Moses but you have the Ark of the Covenant. Do not be afraid because the same God who split the Red Sea is the same God who will split Jordan. Do not be afraid because He will provide for your needs according to His riches and His glory. Do not be afraid because your destiny is not tied to those that exited your life. Your destiny is connected to those that stayed and to God who will never abandon you and never leave you. His name is Emmanuel. No fear. Why? Because He is with me. No fear. Why? Because He is on my side. So spiritual warfare, I must advance when I feel like I'm shrinking, when I feel like people are leaving, when I feel like the finances are slipping away. I must advance. I must move forward. Somebody dropped it in the chat. Advance, not retreat. Dropped it in the chat. You must advance not retreat. If Moses exited your life, advance. Don't retreat. If manna left your life, advance. Don't retreat. Maybe because of this COVID you lost your business. Maybe because of this COVID you lost your customers. Maybe because of this COVID you lost some friends. Maybe the people that you relied on, they're no longer there in your life. And you feel an attack right now of fear. You feel an attack of anxiety. You feel an attack of chronic timidity. You feel paralyzed. Your heart is melting. Not like wax in the presence of God, but like you're unsure, you're confused. The Word of the Lord for you today. Don't be afraid. Why? Because your enemy is terrified of you. And therefore you should not be terrified of your enemy or your circumstances. Drop that in the chat. Don't be afraid because your enemy is terrified. You don't need to be terrified. You are transformed. You are new. You are righteousness of Christ. Fear has no place. Why fear has no place? Because you fear God and the fear of God destroys every other fear. You know what I fear? I fear God and therefore I shouldn't fear my circumstances. Come on, drop that in the chat. If you're watching or re-watching, do not be afraid, only fear God. Do not be afraid, only fear God. I really feel strongly in my spirit right now. There are people that are watching and re-watching this. You've entered into a new season, but you honestly feel like God has abandoned you. You don't realize actually you're closer to the promises of God than you've ever been. You don't realize you're closer and how I know you're closer because it's harder. Certain people exited your life. Certain things exited your life. But now you have fear knocking on the door and says you won't make it. The walls can't be penetrated. You don't have a plan. You don't have a degree. You don't have a strategy. You have no place to live. You have no connections. You're alone. You're just going to be a single mom. You're going to be a single dad. You're going to be a person with a divorce on your record. You're going to be a person with a bankruptcy on your record. You won't have enough. You won't make it. And I came here today to punch fear right in the face and to expose every fear and to tell you that fear masquerades as wisdom. Fear masquerades as caution. Fear masquerades as common sense. Fear masquerades as be a realist. You know what? Just think clearly about life. Don't rely on your faith. Fear is a liar. Fear is false evidence appearing real. Fear is mocking your faith. Fear is mocking your God. Fear is mocking your future. Fear is mocking your prayer life. And therefore you have to come out and you have to destroy, shred, 
break free from that fear because the enemy is terrified. I want the enemy to be afraid of me. I don't want to be afraid of the future. I don't want to be afraid of driving. Some of you, you're afraid of getting married. There are people, you're, you're afraid of driving. You're afraid of getting sick. Listen, get rid of that fear right now. Shake that thing off in Jesus' mighty name. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but spirit of power, spirit of love, and spirit of sound mind. Come on somebody, drop that fire emoji if you believe that God has not given you a spirit of fear. Don't be afraid, only fear God. It's interesting because the moment Joshua got his courage, the moment Joshua got his strength, the moment God infused Joshua with courage, something happened with Joshua. The Bible says, the Bible describes that the nation and nations in the land of Canaan were terrified. And guess what happened? They all got defeated because whoever is afraid is already defeated. Whoever is afraid is already defeated. Fear is the John the Baptist of destruction. Fear, when fear comes in, it's already a seed of your defeat. It's interesting because all of these nations at the land of Canaan, they had the weapons. They had the fortified cities. They had every advantage against Israel. You know, their problem was, yes, they, they lived in sin and yes, God pronoun pronounced their doom. But from a practical standpoint of view, they were scared. They were terrified. They were big, but terrified. They had fortified cities, but they couldn't fortify their hearts. They had walls to protect their cities, but they were so scared and terrified. Fear, intimidation, cowardness, this inner paralysis, crazy timidity is the seed of defeat. If you want to walk in spiritual victory, you have to learn to fight fear. If you fight fear, you're on your way to victory. For God has not given you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love and sound mind. Man, I really felt that word. It's for somebody. It's for somebody in that right now that, that is watching. In my spirit, I see like a like a metal web over somebody right now. It's like a snare. The enemy put a, put a web on you and he trapped you. And, and he, the enemy is not even there. The fear of what could, what would happen is driving you crazy right now. It's giving you nightmares. And, and I'm going to pray against it before I'm going to continue just a second, but I'm going to pray against it. If you are watching or re-watching this and you are that person, who has this chronic fear that has entered your life. In the name of Jesus Christ, I take authority right now over that spirit of fear. I break the snare in Jesus' mighty name, the snare of the wicked one. I break the lies of the enemy in the mighty name of Jesus. Be free in Jesus' mighty name. You are in the promised land. The devil is terrified. The enemy is terrified of what God is about to do. Greater is he that is in you than the one that's in the world. Be free from every spirit of fear. Be free from every spirit of fear in the name of Jesus Christ. Every anxiety, I break that off right now in Jesus' mighty name. I break that off every demonic intrusive thought of paranoia. Be free in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, place your hand up on your head right now for just a moment. You can still chat. You can still drop chads. I'll place your hand on your head right now. Be free in Jesus' mighty name. The spirit of fear, go right now. Spirit of fear, come out in the name of Jesus Christ. Spirit of fear, come out in the name of Jesus Christ. That generational paranoia, that generational fear in Jesus' name, the fear of the dark, go in Jesus' name, the fear of driving, go in Jesus' mighty name, the fear of getting sick, 
The fear of premature death, go in Jesus' mighty name. The fear of getting married, go in Jesus' mighty name. The fear of having children, go in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. The fear of the dark, go in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Come out of that person right now in Jesus' mighty name. No fear. Fear, you are illegal in Jesus' name. The only fear that is welcome is the fear of the Lord. Every other fear, you're illegal right now in Jesus' mighty name. The fear of traveling in an airplane, I break that right now in Jesus' mighty name. I break that right now in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Every fear, go. Every fear, go right now in Jesus' mighty name. In the name of Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody, drop that in the chat right now. No more spirit, spirit of fear. Drop that in the chat right now. No more spirit of fear. If you had a problem with driving, if you had a problem of flying, I break that off of you right now in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Be free from that. Be free from that in Jesus' mighty name. Be free from that in the mighty name of Jesus. Satan, not today, you are defeated by the blood of Jesus and the fire of the Holy Ghost. For those of you who had the fear, I want you to read Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1 and meditate on the verses in Joshua chapter 1 where God spoke to Joshua, be courageous, do not be afraid. Be courageous, do not be afraid. Be courageous and not be afraid. Memorize the, 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 the Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy 1 7 where it says, For I have not given you spirit of fear, but spirit of power, love and sound mind. Be courageous and don't be afraid. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Thank you Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your glory. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. No more spirit of fear. No more spirit of fear. No more spirit of fear. Some of you will feel manifestation coming upon you. Just release that. Just let it come out through your breathing. Let it come out through your breathing. Let it come out through your breathing. The metal, the metal web over your life is being broken right now. The metal web is being broken right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Be free in Jesus' mighty name. If you are re-watching or watching, I see that the videos, uh, people are saying the video is freezing. Just, 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 just hang in there. The internet is good on this end, so it, everything should be fine. But just, just hang in with me. The Lord is moving in the name of Jesus. My friend David Diga, thank you for your generous donation in the chat. Everybody welcome. My friend David Diga Hernandez on YouTube. Love you, my friend. And uh, thank you for your friendship. And then thank you for, for being here. So the spiritual warfare, we live in a spiritual world, but we must understand that God wants us to be engaged in spiritual warfare. When Moses and manna exits, a lot of times fear wants to enter and we must fight against that fear because our biggest enemy is fear. Another thing I want to mention about spiritual warfare before I touch the armor of God is in the Promised Land, if you remember Joshua, before Joshua subdued his enemies, he first submitted himself and the Bible says something happened there is they practiced circumcision. They practiced consecration pretty much, sanctification. Uh, Joshua said, sanctify yourselves today for tomorrow God will do wonders in your midst. What I find a challenge with spiritual warfare with people is when people want to subdue without surrender. They want to conquer without consecration. They want to walk in authority without being under authority. If you're taking notes, write this down or drop that in the chat if that's better for you. If you want to walk in the authority, you must walk under the authority of Jesus Christ. If you want to conquer your promised land, what God has for you, you must be consecrated. You must be circumcised if I can say that. You must be pruned in your life. If you want to walk in dominion, you must have discipline. You must have devotion.
The Bible says submit to God and then resist the devil. It doesn't say go and start doing warfare until you first do worship. Many people over glorify warfare but the key to success in warfare is to be successful in worship. Worship is the key to warfare. Submission is the key to subduing. Consecration is the key to conquest. If I want to walk in the authority, I must walk under the authority. Joshua, before Joshua goes into the promised land to conquer, God says, I want to circumcise the, 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 the people of, of mine. I want to circumcise my people before my people go and conquer. It's almost like God is saying, I want your private life to get in order. I want your private life to get right with me. So many people want to have public victories, but they have private defeats. They want to slay Goliaths on the field, but they haven't killed lions behind the scenes. David didn't go and fight against Goliath until he first fought against lions and bears. So I want to encourage you right now in the spiritual warfare, be consecrated and be submitted to God. In Jesus' name. And one more thing, when you experience victory, remember God's promise of victory is for you to experience victory all your life. But we have to go from glory to glory. So many people, what they do is they come from one victory that preceded with prayer, with fasting, with deep dependence on God, with deep consecration towards God. And then when they received that victory, like things shifted, things changed and like they feel better, the nightmares are not there. The fears are squashed. Relationships are doing so much better. Their church life is doing so much better. And what begins to happen is we tend to chill, relax, cool down. I'm reading today in the story of Joshua and man, it's penetrated me. It, it, it hit me like tons of bricks. I see Joshua in the city of Jericho is sending spies, spies come back and they didn't give him a strategy. They came and they said, Jericho is going down. We don't know how, God is with us. These people in Jericho are scared to death. God is with us. Okay. Joshua has an encounter with God. He gives him a strategy that's not conventional and he wins a battle. They go to the next city and I'm reading today the next city. He does exactly the same thing. He sends spies and spies don't come back with faith. They come back with a plan. They now know how to conquer. They take it upon themselves. They're no longer confident which comes from God. They're cocky, conceited, which comes from my experiences. They come and they say, Joshua, not everybody has to go. We got this, like a few thousand people and this city is going to be gone, piece of cake. So Joshua says, okay, no encounter with God, no prayer, no fasting, no pursuit, none of that stuff. We got it. I know how to do it. I'm, I'm an expert in spiritual warfare. I know this. So they send their people while having sin in the camp. They rely on a the strategy, they rely on plan, they rely on the previous experience. They have a formula. And guess what happens? In Jericho, they saved people. In the next city, they lost people. In Jericho, they went with spies and didn't get a strategy, but they got faith. In the next city, the spies came back with a plan, brilliant plan, and it didn't work. What does that mean? Spiritual warfare doesn't work by formula. It works by your dependence on God. The greatest weapon of your victory in spiritual warfare. This is going to be so simple, some of you are going to leave the live stream. 
after this because you'll be like, what? Tell me something deeper. I'm going to tell you this is as deep as it gets. Your greatest weapon is your humility. Your greatest weapon is your dependence on God. You can go to college and get a degree and never be dependent on God. You can win a few battles and get experience and get people invite you to shows and write books but not have dependence. Dominion does not work without dependence. Yesterday's dependence doesn't work today. And this, this hit me today. Joshua depended in the, in the city of Jericho heavily. He, he did not have a smart strategy but dependence on God. And guess what happens in the next city? He depends on the previous experience. He depends on plans and strategies and he gets whipped. And I felt like the Lord spoke to me today. He says, Jericho is not a jump start. He said, what I did in your previous season, it wasn't just to jump start your life, but it's to show you how to depend on me every single season. If you don't depend on me, you might think you got it figured out. You will say the right words. You will do the right actions. It just won't work. Spiritual warfare won't work because you're missing the most important weapon and your weapon is dependence on God. When they got whipped in the next city, when they got defeated in the next city, guess what happens? Joshua tears his clothes and finally Joshua's coming back. He doesn't have a formula. He doesn't have a strategy. He got slapped. His cockiness, his arrogance got slapped right in the face. This whole idea that we got it, all of that got hit hard in the face. And Joshua lays the whole day in the presence of God weeping, crying out, God, where are you? God, why is this happening to us? And God says, get up. Joshua gets up and God begins to deal with sin. God begins to deal with the transgression. God begins to give Joshua a strategy for a small city. I don't need a strategy. I don't need divine intervention. Oh yes you do. You must understand. The next season in your life, the season of warfare, you need divine intervention every step of the way. And you don't get divine intervention if you're not dependent. You will get defeated if you're not dependent. You can have a degree and have a defeat if you're not dependent. You can have knowledge and be defeated because you're not dependent. I see these people sometimes, you know, they fight us on, on social media. Oh, you're not doing this the right way. I'm doing this the right way. Okay. That's not how this works. There's The right way is dependence on God. The right way is not, you're not doing it the right way. You're doing this the right way. The right way is first and foremost dependence on God. You can go to every deliverance minister that you know. You can practice, you can copy and paste everything that everybody's doing. You can read the books from the great deliverance ministers and healing evangelists. You can do that. But if you don't develop your own deep dependence on the Lord, small problems will wipe you out. Small problems will crush you. Mosquitoes type of problems will suck your blood. They will destroy your life. And Joshua spends the whole day crying. As I was studying today, I felt the Holy Spirit put in my heart and He said, you're going to pray either as your response to defeat or as your preparation for victory. Mm. Drop that in the chat. You're going to pray either as your response to defeat or as your preparation for victory. And Joshua in Jericho prayed, had an encounter, and that, pre that prepared him for his victory. But in the next city, he didn't do that. Instead of, he prayed after he got defeated, but he still prayed. When you get victorious, when you get experienced, listen to me, precious young people, 
Listen to me, young adults. Listen to me, those of you who've been in this thing longer than I've been alive. Or maybe it's listening to, you're listening to me and you're like, Vlad, your English is not good, this is not good, and all of that. Listen to me very carefully. I'm going to tell you a secret. The secret is deep dependence on the Lord. Not the length of your prayer. Not the length of your fasting. Not the amount you give or sow into a ministry. Deep dependence on God. If you don't lose the poverty of the Spirit, if you don't lose your humility, if you don't, even if you're victorious, prosperous, blessed and all of the stuff, but you, you keep that thing inside of you, you're small in your eyes and you say, God, I depend on you. I got this victory, I had these deliverances, I had these healings. It seems like, God, I have it figured out, but Lord, I did not get it figured out. I don't want to draw my boldness from my experience. I want to draw my boldness from your presence. I don't want to draw my confidence from the fact that demons obey when I speak your name. I want to draw my confidence from the fact that you are present with me everywhere I go. God says to Joshua, I am with you, therefore you should not be afraid. God did not say to Joshua, don't be afraid because you're smart. God didn't say, be, don't be afraid. Why? Because you're good looking. Don't be afraid. Why? Because you're talented. Don't be afraid. Why? Because you're educated. Don't be afraid. Why? Because you're delivered. Don't be afraid. Why? Because you know what? You got it. No, no, no. He says, don't be afraid because I'm with you. Pharisees saw the disciples were bold because they were with Jesus. You know what scares me? is confidence that I get from my previous experiences. We've done deliverance conferences, we've done deliverance services, we've done deliverances and I'll be honest with you, I'm not scared. I'm not scared of demons and I'm not scared of counterattack and I'm not scared of retaliation. I, I am not scared. Okay, I'm not scared most of the time of public speaking and so for us to do a conference or to do anything or to do something new, is, it's not naturally I'm not that scared and that's dangerous because if you're stepping into an area where you're no longer depending on God. That's not good. And I, I want us to repent for not being dependent on God because we will be defeated. We will be defeated if we're not dependent on God. We will live in disobedience and we will be defeated. And that's what happened to Joshua. And I don't want this to happen to us. Prayer will strip us from our pride and pride will strip us from our protection. Pride will strip us from our authority. Pride will strip us from our power. Pride will strip us from our blessing. It will strip us from our promises. <laughs> if you want to have divine strategies, you have to have deep dependence upon the Lord. No matter how many deliverances you've done, no matter how many people you have healed, no matter how much money you make, no matter how many degrees you have, no matter how good looking you are, no matter how much influence you have, and no matter how you appear to be devoted to God, but deep in your soul, if there is a dependence on God, if there is a hunger, if there is a thirst for God, God's boldness, God's courage, God's anointing will always be on your life. When you lose the hunger, when you lose the desperation, when you lose the dependence, you will be defeated. You will live in disobedience and you will find yourself in the place of destruction. No matter how many promises are given to your life, prophetic words are given to your life, dreams and visions that you have, and it does not matter which Bible university you went. Achan was a soldier. Achan was part of the army. Achan had a promise of God on his life. Achan had a future. Achan, and so did those 36 people that died. They had everything going for them. But when we allow independence, when we think we have spiritual warfare figured out, when we abandon our place of devotion, prayer, fasting, and when we stop depending on God today as we were depending on Him at the place of Jericho, 
before we had any of this blessings that God has given us, when we lose that, it doesn't matter how many books on spiritual warfare, live stream on spiritual warfare, and it doesn't matter if Michael or Gabriel himself lays hands on us. We will not find ourselves in victory because you can't shortcut to God without dependence and humility. Man, we need that more and more today than ever before. In Jesus' name. Amen. Joshua experiences this dependence. He strips himself of pride. Joshua becomes so dependent and God tells Joshua, you're going to go to war, bro. He goes to war. They uh, trick the city. They deceive the city and then they conquer it. The next chapter, and I was reading that today, the Gibeonites come and they pretend that they were from a distant country and they deceived Joshua. And it says this thing, and Joshua did not ask or inquire of the Lord. It's like he didn't learn the lesson. Like, and I love Joshua. Please understand, I'm not dissing on Joshua, guys. I don't want to go to heaven and have Joshua use this video against me and stuff. So um, I like Joshua. Okay, Joshua is one of my favorite um, character. And Joshua, he did not ask the Lord and then he gets deceived. He makes a covenant with the nation God has anointed him to conquer. And I wonder, see this is what happens when we don't depend on the Lord, not only we end up in defeat in the areas that we're supposed to have victory in, but if we don't depend on the Lord, if we don't depend on the Holy Spirit, if we don't go back and lay ourselves prostrate, whether you are being tormented right now, whether you are not being tormented, where you are like peaceful, everything is great, finances are good, relationships are good, your anointing, the, everything is going really well, whatever that is, if you don't depend on the Lord, you will be in defeat. But there's another part, is that Joshua made a covenant with an enemy. God anointed him to conquer. Come on, drop that in the chat. Don't make a covenant with that which the Lord has anointed you to conquer. I'm going to say that again. Don't make a covenant with that which the Lord has anointed you to conquer. But you will make a covenant with that which the Lord has anointed you to conquer if you don't depend on the Lord. You will begin to compromise and justify those compromises. You will begin to twist the Scripture to fit your lifestyle. You will begin to take your issue and make it as your identity. So many people do that. When they begin to say things like, you know, I was born this way. That's just the way that I am made by God. No, 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 no. You're struggling with these same-sex tendencies. You're struggling with these lustful thoughts. That is not who you are. You can't let, let these issues become your identity, but you will let your issue become your identity if you have no intimacy as a foundation in your life. Are you with me? If you don't allow, if you don't allow the intimacy with God to be at the, as a foundation of your life, then your issue will become your identity. Come on somebody, drop that in the chat. Your issue is not your identity. For those of you on Instagram, uh, head over to our YouTube because the audio just died down. So we're going to say bye to you. Those of you on Instagram, uh, just go to our YouTube. For some weird reason, the audio died on, on Instagram. Give me guys just one second. I'm going to dismiss everybody on, on, on Instagram. Yeah, so for those of you on Instagram, just head over to our YouTube right now. I'm going to cancel this stream. And um, so when there is no dependence, we get defeated and then we start allowing our enemy, uh, uh, we start allowing our issues to become our identity. We start allowing the things that God has anointed us to conquer to just say, hey, that, that's just who I am. Like you're scared of the dark? Nah, that's just, that's just the way I am. Um, anxiety? Oh no, that's, I'm just an anxious person. Uh, and people begin to give them diagnosis. No, that's just, that's just me. That's just who I am. 
I'm just an angry person. Um, well, that's just what guys do. They watch porn. That's just I'm just one of the guys. No, 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 no. <laughs> you should not make a covenant with that which God called you to conquer. No, my friend. You should not turn and make your issue into your identity. No, my friend. You are supposed to conquer that. But you can't conquer that if you are not laying as a foundation of your life your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Your dependence on God is the foundation for refusing to let your issue be embedded in who you are today. In Jesus' mighty name. Come on somebody, drop that in the chat if you're in agreement. And if you're coming from Instagram to YouTube, we welcome you as well. Welcome to YouTube. And now toward the end of this stream, I would like to share with you concerning our armor of God. And you may say, well Vlad, you've been sharing for like almost an hour. What were you sharing about? I was sharing with you about the most important weapon that every Christian has, which is your dependence. The next things I'm going to talk about next few minutes are all, I really believe, as important as they are. If you don't have a hard posture of dependence and humility, all of these things are going to be so mechanical. And I see people claiming, naming, blabbing, grab it, confessing, possess it, stump it on the ground, walk around your Jericho, make a shout, ooh, and none of the stuff works. And they're like, oh, spiritual warfare doesn't work. It's not that spiritual warfare doesn't work. Your posture is wrong. L look at the promised land and look at, look at Joshua in the promised land. It wasn't the techniques. It wasn't the formula. It wasn't the conference that they went to, the book that they read, the podcast they listened to, the blog they read. No, it was the hard posture of dependence. And it was so hard to keep that posture because Joshua kept messing up. And that gives me so much hope because I do the same thing. I get so excited. I get this Jericho victory that I fasted, prayed, and just stood in the gap for it. God was so good. God showed up. It was so amazing. And, and then I'm like, oh, I got it. Thanks, God. I've got this figured out. And God's like, no, you don't. You need to be constantly, always, intentionally dependent on me. And if you're not, you will be defeated. You might not be defeated by Jericho problems. You'll be defeated by something small. And if you're not, you're not going to have discernment. And you're not going to have a discernment. Your brain, your mind and your experience is limited. Joshua lacked discernment with Gibeonites because he didn't depend on the Lord. He got defeated with Gibeonites because he got deceived by Gibeonites. How did that happen? The Bible says, and he did not inquire of the Lord. If you live your life dependent, that's your strongest and your biggest weapon. Now let's get to the practical weapons, the weapons over warfare. Let's get to the practical armor of God. So the verse that I'm going to read to you is this, but the biggest weapon is our dependence. Amen. Somebody dropped that in the chat. The biggest weapon, the biggest weapon of our warfare is our dependence on God. Now let's read this Ephesians chapter 6 verse 13 until down. Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Remember last week we talked about that our victory is from victory, not for victory. We're not trying to win, we're trying to stand so that you can withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. That means that when you've done everything that you can, just stand. Don't move, don't go back, don't fall, just stand. Stand therefore, again he says to stand, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shot your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and sword of the Spirit which is the Word of God. So let me go through uh, these armors of God. The first thing that's very important that each one of us have to understand is we don't make the armor of God, we put on the armor of God. Drop that in the chat. We don't produce the armor of God, we practice the armor of God, meaning we apply the armor of God. Paul does not say make the armor, he says put on the armor. Every Christian already has this, I believe has this armor, 
but not every Christian wears the armor of God. So in order for you to be successful in spiritual warfare, you must wear the armor of God. Come on somebody, drop that in the chat. In order to be successful in spiritual warfare, you must wear the, spirit, the armor of God. You don't have to make the armor of God, you just have to wear the armor of God. So you don't have to make the armor of God, you have to wear the armor of God. So God gives this armor to us, we have to put it on. I got, I have a moped, 49cc Honda, I think it's Honda. Uh, very small, not super fast. My wife doesn't trust me with fast things. Um, she says that I can kill myself. She's not 100% wrong. Okay, so 49cc, it can only go for 50 miles per hour and one time when I lived very close to the church, like few streets from the church, I was riding that moped during the summer without a helmet. Now, mind you, I have a lot of helmets, okay? I think I had like four helmets at the time. I just did not wear one. So the police officer pulls me over and the police officer gives me a ticket in my own driveway. And I was like, sir, I have a helmet. Look, it's in the garage. And he's like, I'm not giving you a ticket because you don't have a helmet. I'm giving you a ticket because you're not wearing a helmet. Hmm. And that made me think. He said, if you would fall and hurt your head, the fact that you have a helmet in the garage will not protect you. You will still get hurt even though you have a helmet. You just don't wear one. I wonder how many Christians have the armor, they just never put it on. I'm going to break it down something to you. I believe this is going to set somebody free. You have the helmet of salvation, but do you put it on? Or are you wearing a hat of condemnation? Come on somebody, drop that in chat. Helmet or a hat? Are you wearing a helmet or are you wearing a hat? So what I mean by that is this. So many people have a helmet of salvation in their closet, but what they wear, meaning what they live conscious of, is the hat of condemnation. What are you conscious of? What are you confessing? What are you convicted, convinced of? Salvation or condemnation? You're saved as a Christian, right? You're saved as a Christian. But are you conscious of your salvation? Are you convinced of your salvation? Are you confessing your salvation or are you constantly living in condemnation? You can be saved and live in condemnation. You can confess condemnation. You can believe in condemnation. You can even walk around and say, I'm just no, no good. I'm, I'm just a sinner, just trying to be saved and be a Christian. So the question is not, do you have the armor? The question is, are you wearing an armor? I wonder how many attacks are simply tickets for not wearing an armor? I wonder how many hurts could have been avoided if we wouldn't just have, but we would wear it. So, let's look at it. How do we put on this armor of God? Number one is you have to move from condemnation, from condemnation to salvation. That means you have to think yourself saved. Confess yourself as saved. If you are saved, take the hat off. Live from this thing, I am accepted, I am loved, I am forgiven. If you wear a helmet of salvation, you protect your head. So much mind attacks, mind wars will be deflected from your mind if you would live with this reality. My sins are paid for. My name is written in the book of life. I am saved. Come on somebody, if you are saved by the blood of Jesus, could you drop that in the chat right now? I am saved. Jesus is my Savior. 
You know what's going to happen? It's going to protect your head, your mind. Mind wars, mind attacks will be deflected. You'll be able to stop those arrows with the helmet of salvation. There's no more condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I am saved. The second one is God wants us to go from we have to confess it, we have to be conscious of it, we have to be convinced of it, I am saved. The second one is we have to move from rags to righteousness. The breastplate. So the helmet protects my head, the breastplate protects my heart. Drop that in the chat. Helmet protects my head, he breastplate protects my heart. Helmet, I am saved. Breastplate, I am righteous. What is the difference? See, helmet claims that I was a sinner who became saved through the blood. The breastplate says, I am righteous. This is more than I'm forgiven. This is more than I've been pardoned. Righteousness means I have a right standing with God. God is pleased with me through the blood of Jesus Christ. That means I'm not a sinner. That means I am not a weak person, a wicked person. I'm not a struggling sinner. I am a righteous person who fights sin. I'm not a sinner, I'm righteous who fights sin. If you believe that you're a sinner trying to get righteous, you're not wearing a breastplate. You are wearing a rag that is bullet, can't deflect bullets and it's going to attack you. Come on somebody. <laughs> Guys, I'm going to demonstrate it. I'm going to mess up my hair today, but it's completely fine. It's worth it for the illustration. So, this is what it looks like if you are condemned, okay? Might look good, but this is not going to protect you, okay? This is not going to protect you. A lot of you religious people, <laughs> you are like this. You're walking around with condemnation. You're not good enough. You never measure up. And so my goal today is to let you know, you got to take that off. Like this can be warm, but it's not going to protect your head. It can protect your head from the cold. It will not protect your head from the arrows of the enemy. So what you need to do, you need to get yourself... Come on somebody. You need to get yourself this. If you want to... You got to put a helmet on. Now, of course, when Paul was talking about a helmet, he wasn't talking about this one. I don't have like a, a warrior's helmet. I have um, this helmet. So you got to put a helmet on. You got to have, because this, this is more than just will keep you warm. It will keep you protected and it will keep you safe. Amen. You are saved. And if you live with that reality, you will be safe. Same thing has to happen with your breastplate. I'm going to put this on just for a few more points, just to kind of keep you guys' attention for a little bit. Same thing has to happen with your breastplate. A lot of your hearts, the heart, people get problems with their heart because they walk around with this thing that I'm not good enough. They walk around with this thing that I'm just an old sinner. I didn't pray enough. I didn't read enough. I'm not enough. If you are not enough, you're wearing a rag. You're not wearing a breastplate. It's true that you're not enough. But in Christ, you are righteous. Come on, somebody. Drop that in the chat. I am righteous through Christ. I am righteous through Christ. That means that in Jesus, I am accepted and I am enough. 
I'm not righteous because I haven't missed my devotions. I'm not righteous because I fasted for 40 days. I'm not righteous because I have given to the church faithfully. I'm not righteous because I didn't do anything foolish in the last few days. I am righteous because Jesus Christ became sin on the cross that I will become righteous. The Bible says in Corinthians that He made Him who knew no sin to become sin for us. How did Jesus become sin? Not because He smoked weed, drank, drunk and hung out and you know and slept around. No, He became sin because He surrendered to His Father and the Father placed the sin of us on Him. How do you become righteous? The same way. You surrender to the Father, you place your trust in Jesus and the Father places the righteousness of Jesus on you. And that righteousness is not filthy rags. That righteousness is not all kinds of clothing and rags. That righteousness is a breastplate. And guess what righteousness does? It protects your heart. Somebody dropped it in the chat. Righteousness protects your heart. Salvation protects your head. Righteousness protects your heart. Salvation protects your your head. Now let's go a little bit further. The Bible says you have to have truth. You have to have truth. The Bible says that you have to have a belt of truth. Now what happens with a lot of people today, instead of having a belt of truth, this is the belt, okay. What does the belt do? The belt it supports your, what belt did is it supported the armor, it held everything, it goes in the center of your body and it holds all of the armor together. On the belt you would put the sword as well, so it would hold the sword and the belt is really the center piece that holds everything together. The belt of truth. Now it's important, let me tell you something about the truth. Many people today, they don't carry the belt and if you don't carry, like for example, I wear jeans right now and I'll be honest with you, if I would not have the belt, <laughs> my pants will fall off or I would be saggy walking like a gangster, okay? And so what the belt does is it holds everything together. For a Christian in the warfare, as a soldier of Christ, you must understand is that you cannot live your life by the facts. You got to live your life by the truth. The truth never changes, facts do. Facts are true, but they're not the truth. Facts is what you feel, facts is what you see. Facts is what people say. The truth is Jesus Christ. He said, I am the truth. Muhammad said, I'm the prophet of truth. Buddha said, I am the secret of truth. Jesus says, I am the truth. You know, what is the truth? It's not what, it's who. When Jesus Christ is the center of your life, He tightens everything, He holds everything. And I trust His Word more than my feelings, doctor's report, more than what I see, then my whole life is held together. So many Christians, they live by facts instead of the truth. They trust their feelings. Oh, I don't feel it. Mm. I just, I just, I just don't feel it. Just, I'm just not sure. Man, I just, it's just so hard. I'm just so confused. Just so. And you ask them why, they'll tell you all the reasons why. And after they're done telling you all the reasons, you will be as depressed as they are. And why? No belt. No truth. A lot of feelings, a lot of emotions, a lot of moodiness, a lot of complaining, a lot of quoting what the doctor says, what the news media says, what my feelings said, what my bank statement said, a lot of what my ex said, what the voices in my head said, all of that stuff. These are facts. These are not truth. The truth is what Jesus said. And when you allow that, to be the center of your life, it holds you together. It keeps you stable, keeps you steady, keeps you strong. It keeps you standing. Without it, you don't have a belt. If you don't have a truth, you don't have a belt. If you don't have a belt, you don't have any support. 
You don't have any stability. You can't stand. You're going to be ashamed. Why? Because your pants are going to fall off. Why? Because your nakedness is going to be seen. You will be exposed. You will be vulnerable. And you will definitely be under attack that you allowed yourself in because you refuse to believe the truth. So many times when we receive people who get delivered and honestly the hardest part is, is right here. It's the hardest part is for them to believe the truth about what God says about them and about their experience. Many people do not want to do that. They chase their feelings like some kind of a lost child. They keep chasing their, their improvement in their mood instead of focusing on the truth. What does the truth say? What does Jesus say? Amen. Come on somebody, drop that in the chat, that Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the truth. He's my belt. He holds my life. Everything hangs on Him. The sword of the Spirit hangs on Jesus because Jesus and His Word is one. Can I go a little bit further? If you want me to go a little bit further, drop number one in the chat. So we mentioned that we're going from condemnation to salvation. We're going from rags to righteousness. We're going from facts to truth. Let's go a little bit further. Let's go deeper. We have to go from feelings to faith. Because after my breastplate and my belt, my helmet, now I have to have a shield. The shield, the scripture says, is the shield of faith. Now why is the shield very important? Because the shield protects other pieces of armor. The shield protects the helmet. The shield protects the, sh the breastplate. The shield even protects my belt. The shield protects other parts of my body. The shield moves. The shield, uh, these were large shields that Roman soldiers would hide even under. The shield was very crucial because it would fight back against the fiery darts of the enemy. It will really stop them from penetrating the soldier but not stop them from being thrown at the soldier. Let me say that again. The shield does not stop the fiery darts. The shield stops the fiery darts from destroying you and wounding you. Let me speak to you just a moment about the shield. The shield is your faith. The shield is your trust. The shield is this quiet trust in God's promise, presence, in God's character. If you lose that, you become vulnerable. But typically instead of a shield, we end up having feelings. Everyone has feelings. Christian is a believer who has feelings. A person without a shield is a feeler who wants to have faith. You are not a feeler. You are a believer who has a word of faith who has a gift of faith, who has the seed of faith, who has the fruit of faith, who belongs to the household of faith and who is called to live a life of faith. No matter how many miracles you experience, you will never graduate from your need to exercise trust. No matter how calm, amazing and perfect your life becomes, you will still be a believer on this side of eternity. That means the muscle of faith must constantly be stretched and exercised. That means that I must not let go of my shield. See, faith is not only to get me a miracle. Faith is my shield. That means if I don't get a miracle, I still believe. I don't believe in healing. I believe in the healer. I don't believe in salvation. I believe in the Savior. I don't believe in deliverance. I believe in a deliverer. Paul says, I know in whom I have believed. Job says, I know 
my Redeemer lives. So these men, they didn't have faith in faith. They had faith in God. See, many people's faith struggles because it's faith in faith. Come on somebody, drop that in the chat. Don't have faith in faith. Have faith in God. Oh, I had faith and I lost it. You can't. If you have faith in God, God doesn't fail. Your faith can fail if you have it in you. But faith gets, gets its strength from God because God is the support for that faith. And He says he, those who trust in Him will not be disappointed. The problem with us is that we have faith in faith. And the problem with us is that many of us, we, we're living like feelers. We're this moody, cranky, easily swayed like a wave tossed to and fro by the wind, full of doubt and a little bit of faith. And, and th th this whole thing kind of exists in our life. I'm going to pray, God, give me a miracle, give me a miracle. A miracle doesn't happen. That's it. I give up. I, I can't believe anymore. Why? I'm done. I just, I lost my faith. Why? Because God did not answer me. Can I tell you something? You never had faith in God. You just had faith in you. You had faith in the miracle. You had faith in what God was supposed to do. But in God, trusting Him, leaning on Him, that my friend is different. Can I tell you the difference? I heard this story. It always illustrated that to, to me easily. This guy was walking over the Niagara Falls on the rope. I think it's an illustration. I don't think it was really a story, a real, real story. Um, he walked on Niagara Falls. Everybody applauded. Then he took a wheelbarrow and carried a wheelbarrow over the Niagara Falls on the rope. Everyone was like, oh my goodness, that's so amazing. That is so awesome. Everybody clapped. I mean, people were so ecstatic. And then what began to happen, he said, how many of you believe that I can put a person in the wheelbarrow and carry this wheelbarrow or you know pull this wheelbarrow over the rope over the Niagara Falls on the rope well everybody's like he just did it with an empty wheelbarrow of course you can do it yes you can do it I believe you can do it I believe you can do it I believe you can do it everybody starts shouting yes 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 and then he says who would we who would want to volunteer to get into the wheelbarrow and the crowd got silent because see, faith that He can take the wheelbar wheelbarrow over the Niagara Falls, that's not faith. That's an emotional response. Real faith was to go into a wheelbarrow and trust Him not to drop you. That's, that's real faith because you know what faith is? Faith is trust. Helmet, breastplate, belt and the shield. It's quiet trust. I trust Him. I trust God. Whether He heals me or not, He's my healer. Whether I get delivered or not, He is my deliverer. He is in whom I trust. Demons believe and they're still demons. They're still going to hell because they don't trust. Demons don't trust God. Demons believe God exists. So for those of you who applaud yourself that you believe that God exists, well, welcome to the demon level faith. They have the same thing. What we have is trust. And therefore our faith is not in faith. Our faith is quiet trust in the character of God. It protects us in the realm of the Spirit. It protects us in spiritual warfare. Guess, guess what begins to happen? The fiery darts, oh they will come. Oh they will hit. And my defense is my trust. I trust Him. Though He slay me, I trust Him. In the valley I trust Him. On the mountain top I trust Him. And that quiet trust is what will get me through. And the fiery darts will shoot. I won't bleed because I'm protected. Come on somebody. Shoes of peace. 
the shoes of peace. And that is, that is speaking about the peace of God, the preaching of the good news. That is speaking about experiencing God's peace in the process. I remember one time I was praying, I decided to, I think it was like eight or ten hours, no I think it was eight hours of prayer non-stop and so I walked, when I pray I walk and so I had these really bad shoes. Now they were really good shoes for a short distance but for a long distance so I walked for about eight hours back and forth in prayer. My feet were killing me. You know, because I had these cheap shoes and these like shoes not necessarily for long distance. And I realized something very important at that time. If you don't have comfortable shoes, you will not go long distance without hurting your feet. And see, you must understand that God is giving us His peace and He wants us to put it on. When you put on the peace of God, it gives longevity to your journey. It gives longevity to your journey. and. Please hear me loud and clear. Peace is not absence of problems. Peace is the presence of Jesus. He slept in the storm. He is the Prince of Peace. Peace is not absence of your financial problems. Peace is not absence of, oh my kids are finally serving God, everything is good, so that's, that's, that's why I'm peaceful. No, 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 that's not where the peace comes from. A lot of people lost their peace during pandemic. You know why? It's because now their journey got a little bit harder and their shoes are not suitable for this journey because they don't have peace. The Bible says, in this world you will have tribulation but in me you will have peace. And I just want to speak God's peace over your life right now in the name of Jesus Christ. And the last thing is the sword of the Spirit which is the Word of God. I want to remind you that the Bible is written by the Holy Spirit. I want to remind you that the Bible is empowered by the Holy Spirit and I want to remind you that when you are in the spiritual warfare or in spiritual wilderness, the Word of God is so empowered by the Holy Spirit that if you speak it, the Spirit of God is going to move. The Word of God, it says the sword of the Spirit. I find that interesting. It didn't say the sword of Jesus. It didn't say the sword of the Father. The sword of the Spirit because the Scripture is God-breathed. The Scripture is God-breathed. That means the Spirit is in the Scriptures. So sometimes if you are in the spiritual warfare and you're not feeling the Spirit, you're not experiencing the Spirit, I'm going to give you a secret that can change your life. When you don't feel the Holy Spirit, feed on the Holy Scriptures because the Spirit is in the Scriptures. It's the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. The Word of God is Rhema. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. Drop that in the chat. If you don't feel the Spirit, feed on the Scriptures. Feed on the Scriptures because the Spirit is in the Scriptures. Amen? In Jesus' mighty name. So, to summarize everything, let's come back to the beginning. The, most, the greatest weapon of your warfare is your dependence on God. When you lose your dependence, you become defeated. When you become defeated, you lose discernment. You will pray either as your preparation for victory or as your response for defeat. It's better to pray in preparation. There is no formula or some strategy that will work without prayer and without the Holy Spirit. Your previous experience is good but God wants you to live on your fresh encounters with Him. We learned that from Joshua that spiritual warfare will not work if we don't walk in worship, consecration, submission and under authority. We also learn from our friend Joshua, it's one thing to be delivered from the enemy but God really wants you to defeat the enemy. Therefore warfare is good and bondage is bad. Wickedness is bad but warfare is good. Going into practical how armor of God works, you don't get it. You don't get it by achieving it. you simply receiving it as a gift. You just have to apply it. Live conscious, confess, develop a conviction about these truths that you are saved, you are righteous, Jesus is the truth, 
faith over facts, uh, faith over feelings, I'm sorry, faith over facts, not faith over facts, faith over feelings, truth over facts, not faith over, over facts. God's peace and then the Spirit of God is in the Holy Scriptures and I have to speak the Scriptures in my warfare. Speak the Word. Meditate on the Word and speak the Word. Sometimes I have to write it down. Sometimes I have to memorize it. When you are in the warfare, you don't just ask, Lord, please help me. Please rebuke the devil. No, you have to rebuke the devil. How do I rebuke the devil? By the Holy Word of God. Get behind me, Satan. God has not given me spirit of fear, but spirit of power, love and sound mind. You speak to that enemy. You rebuke him. You take authority and you command him. The Bible says submit and resist. That means you do that. And how do you do that? See, you're covered, you're saved, you're righteous, you have the truth, you have God's peace. You trust God. You're full of the Holy Ghost. And now release the Word of God. Speak the Word of God. Because the power of the Holy Spirit is when you are speaking. It's released when you are speaking the Holy Scriptures. In Jesus' mighty name. Guys, Father, I pray right now for every person that is watching. Precious Holy Spirit, thank You for making us participators in Your plan on this earth. I thank You for every person that is watching and that will be re-watching this broadcast. Thank You, Lord, for each one of Your soldiers, for our wonderful family of believers. Holy Spirit, open our eyes. I break every independence, pride, self-righteousness. Give us your freedom, Lord. Let us walk in humility. Holy Spirit, I pray for those who live in shame, guilt, stress, swamped with facts, living in their feelings and in their emotions instead of speaking to their soul. They are living in their soul. I pray that you will just, just break that off of them right now, Lord. I pray for those who lost their faith because they never really had faith in You. They had faith in their faith and it failed them. I pray that today they will move from feelings to faith, from condemnation to salvation, from rags to righteousness. That they will move from stress to peace in Jesus' name. I speak Your breakthrough. I speak Your life in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen.